Okay, Transformation Tuesday. We are exploring transformations in section 1.8. What we're talking about with transformations is what are the different types of transformations? There's four we're going to look at, and then each one is broken up into two different versions, so a total of eight. And then how do we represent these translations mathematically? What can we do to graphs and to their equations to represent these translations in a mathematical sense rather than just a graphic sense? Okay. When we talk about transformations, what we're getting at is change to a figure, change to a graph, change to some sort of object. That word transform means to change. Specifically, it means that we're changing the position or location of an object, changing the shape of an object, could be changing the size, could be changing the orientation, which way it faces, that would be like if we're flipping it. Okay, we got lots of different ways we can transform it. Sometimes it's easy for us to think about transformations in terms of the movie, the Transformer movies. In those movies, you have cars that all of a sudden transform into fighting war machine things, action hero, whatever. Okay? Their shape changes from car. Their shape changes from car to this action figure thing. It undergoes that transformation with that actual change that's happening. So anytime you see transformation, you're thinking change. Four types of transformations. Okay, the first two that we're going to talk about, they make congruent shapes. The first two transformations will make shapes that are congruent to the original shape. The image, the new shape, the image, will be congruent to the old shape, which is called the pre-image. Okay, the very first one is a translation. Translation is a slide. Okay, you're just going to slide your object or your graph one way or the other. Up, down, left, or right. Okay, two ways we can translate. We can do a horizontal translation. Or we can do a vertical translation. Okay, if we're moving horizontally left or right, we're going to be working specifically with our x coordinate. Okay, so we start with an ordered pair x, y, and what we do is we add h to the x coordinate. Okay. y is going to stay the same. Now for vertical, we go the other way. x stays the same, but y gets added. It has k added to it. That number h and k is the amount of units, or the number of units that we are going to be translating. Okay. Um, something you probably should know. We will move left or down, right? Those would be our negative values when h and k are less than 0. Left and down when h and k are less than 0. That should make sense because left is negative, so less than 0, negative numbers. Down is negative, so less than 0, negative numbers. We move right or up. when h and k are positive, greater than zero. If it's zero, we're not moving. Notice we're not ever equal to zero, that doesn't make sense. We want to move the graph. You can't move something if you don't change it at all. You can't change something by adding zero, okay? So greater than zero, right or up. Less than zero, left or down. Just add it, just add that number. Pretty easy to do a translation. Next one's reflection. A reflection is a flip, or a mirror image. If you look in the mirror, and you put up your right hand, your mirror looks like it's putting up its left hand. It's been flipped. You've been flipped. Okay? A reflection is a flip. Now, we can still do horizontal reflection and vertical reflection. But we treat them a little bit differently. Horizontal reflection means that we are going to take an object that's on a right side of the y-axis and flip it across the y-axis to the left side. It just flips from one way to the, one side to the other. In doing that, we take the x-coordinate and make it the opposite. The x-coordinate becomes the opposite of what it really was to begin with. It flips to the other side, so now it goes from positive to negative or vice versa. Vertical, we flip across the x-axis. It starts up high, 
line goes down low, or vice versa. To do a vertical reflection, x is going to stay the same. We don't need it to move left or right at all. We just need it to move up or down, or flip up or down. Okay? So with reflections, you have to think carefully. If you're reflecting across y, that's a horizontal move. It's going to flip to the other side, just right, left, or right. From the right to the left or vice versa, so you're going to touch the x coordinate. Okay? Those two will make congruent transformations. The image that you make is exactly the same as the image you started with. These next two, they do not make congruent images. They are not congruent. No way, no how can these be congruent. The whole point of them is that you change the size of your shape. Okay, the first one is called a stretch. You're going to grab that shape and you're going to pull it. Picture a rubber band, a nice round rubber band. You're going to take the two sides of your rubber band and you're going to pull them as far as you can horizontally. You're pulling them as far as you can up and down. You're stretching that rubber band. You can also squish your rubber band in, right? That's what we're going to talk about next. Horizontal stretch. You take that rubber band and you Put your fingers in and you pull left and right. Your left hand pulls left, your right hand pulls right. You are stretching that rubber band horizontally. Okay? When you do that, you're working with those x values. Left and right always means x. Horizontal, we think x. Okay? So with that x value, we are going to multiply it by some factor b. b tells us what to multiply by. b is the factor. Why does it change? Okay, for a vertical stretch, that means we're taking a rubber band and we're pulling it up and down. Vertical stretch, we multiply the y value. Because we're changing how far it is from where it was originally, we're going to change it. So we multiply it by a. A gives you b. Okay? For both of these, the goal is to make the shape bigger. You're stretching it out. If you're grabbing it, you want x to get further from where it was originally. You're going to multiply it and make it bigger. In both of these cases, a is greater than 1 and b is greater than 1. That whole idea of the identity, if you multiply by 1, that multiplicative identity, the shape won't change. Okay? So that's why we're greater than 1. Everything is referenced here in terms of 1. We also talk about absolute value because... When we stretch something, if we multiply by a negative, that's fine. We're just going to get a reflection. So that negative, or that absolute value, accounts for the negative you might have in the reflection. Okay? Then the last one needs a little bit more room here. Maybe. Fantastic, got a little bit more room. So with that rubber band example, talking about stretching that rubber band, we also can compress it. We can take the two edges and squish them back in towards itself. Or we can take the top two and squish it. Now I know a circle doesn't have edges, but you can kind of picture the sides when you lay it down on the ground. So we are talking about compressing the two sides, or a compression. Stretch and compress are opposites in one sense of the word, because a stretch makes it bigger in that direction, a compression squishes it back down. Because they're very, very similar, we're still going to multiply, if we're horizontal, we're still going to multiply x by b. And for vertical, we are going to multiply y by a. So vertical, stretch it out, horizontal, compress it, or excuse me, let me try that again. Vertical, compress it from top and bottom and pull towards the middle, horizontal, from left and right, squishing it in towards the middle. Notice that with stretch, our factors, A and B, were factors bigger than 1 so that they can make the shape larger. Compression are going to be between 0 and 1, because we're going to still be talking about absolute value, and you can't have negative absolute value, and so we're going to shrink them down. And almost that idea of reciprocals, okay? So the rule here, Our absolute value of A is going to be between 0 and 1. Like 1 half, that would be a compression. If you compress by 1 half, it's going to be half the size. Okay. Another, um, for B, maybe it's 1 third. It's going to be a third of the size. So that factor is important. So for this chunk, we're 
we're going to talk about how we transform a graph just looking at the ordered pairs and applying these rules to the ordered pairs. When we get to chapter 2, we will actually do transformations on equations for absolute value. In chapter 4, not 4, chapter 5, we'll do equations where we do it to quadratics, all that good stuff. Okay, four steps for transforming a graph using only ordered pairs. One, two, three, four. First thing is you are going to need some ordered pairs. I like four to six. Why? Because then I can actually see what's going on. One is not enough. Ten is probably too much work. Okay, four to six is a nice number. You're going to set up a table with those ordered pairs. It's kind of an extended table. Instead of just having x and y in your table, you're going to add another column. If you are translating something where you're working with the x side, you're going to add a column on the left. If you're translating something with just the y, you're going to put your column on the right where you can do those changes. Okay? So we're going to add a transformation column. Let's call it a transformation column. It goes on the left for x, which makes sense because x is usually on the left side and it goes on the right for y. Left for x, right for y. Okay. Then in that transformation column, you are going to do those transformations so that you can find your ordered pairs. Only one thing should be changing at a time. If you have two things changing, then you're going to need two columns. So you're going to have to read carefully to make sure that you need to actually change x and change y. You'll now have four new ordered pairs. Once you have those four new ordered pairs, plot it. Make it happen. You worked hard. Make it happen. Own your greatness. Okay? So let's look at some examples with this so we kind of have an idea of what we're doing. So we've got our table set up here for this example. The graph is kind of a zigzaggy looking thing, but there were some clearly marked ordered pairs that we could put into a table. One of those ordered pairs was negative 3, negative 1, 1, 3, 1, negative 1, 3, 3, and 5, negative 1. Just pulled right off the graph. Okay, not meant to be real tricky. We just saw them and used them. Now, that first example, you're supposed to go four units to the left. Left means I'm working with x. So I want to add to that x column. I'm going to put it on the left because I'm, it goes with x. Now, four units to the left, that represents negative 4. So we're going to do x plus that negative 4. You might want to think of it as x minus 4. So here, negative 3 minus 4 is negative 7. 1 minus 4 is negative 3. 1 minus, oh shoot, that should say negative 1. My bad. Okay, so that negative 1 minus 4, now that we got it fixed, is going to be negative 5. You know, we probably would have caught that when we were graphing, but it's better to catch it before. And we're just going to keep filling in what we have going on here. So we've filled in the column, we've transformed, now we need our new ordered pairs. Our first new ordered pair is negative 7, negative 1. Negative 5, 3. Negative 3, negative 1. And these are ordered pairs that we can plot. Okay? So this negative 7, negative 1 is now way out here. Negative 5, 3. Negative 5 up to 3. Negative 3, negative 1. Negative 1, 3. And 1, negative 1. Okay? The new graph should resemble the old one. We said they were going to be congruent, so they should look the same. Does that look the same? Yeah, it totally does. See, if we were to move this one down, if we were to move this graph down right here, it would look as though we've shifted it three units to the left. Four units to the left. Okay? No, I don't want it down there. I want it up higher so that it doesn't get in our way. There we go. Okay, now we're reflecting. In the second one, we're reflecting across x. If we go back and look into our notes, across the x-axis. To visualize it, we're going to start with them here, and we're going to reflect it to the other side. Don't listen to that. We're going to start with it here, and we're going to reflect it across the x-axis, that's my bad, to the other side. Okay? Since it's being reflected vertically, starting up high, ending down low, up and down, we're going to set our column up, 
and the wide side. 